particular interests or particular paths or particular quirks. And uh, I guess I'm the first up to bat here. Uh, if I could figure out how to get this to work. Yes. Okay. I am an anthropologist of Korea. I've done field work in South Korea for since the mid-1970s. And uh, I've painfully learned to read and speak the language, never, of course, to my own satisfaction. I've spent much of my career working with writing about Korean shamans called Udang, Manshin, Bosang. Um, and I've authored several books on the subject. Uh, over the years, I've made my offerings in shaman shrines. I've pressed my palms together uh, in supplication. I've bowed to the floor in the direction of the gods who hang above the altar. I knew that the paintings were sacred in their way, and that as with all shamanic paraphernalia, they were charged and powerful, and you know, not things to be messed with. But I did not yet give much thought to how the sacredness of the painting worked. I did not yet see a connection between gods operating through the paintings hung in shrines and gods operating through the inspired bodies of their chosen shamans. I appreciated, of course, how the munchin, in a succession of costumes, postures, and facial expressions, mirrors the series of painted gods in her shrine with animated performance. And I'll just show you quickly some examples. In night now, but how this for me? You'll hear from my colleagues some of their interests and how their interests were provoked in the topic of shaman paintings. For me, in 1983, I heard a remarkable story about grandmothers and grandfathers, the gods and goddesses, in the shrine of the woman in my that in my writing I call Yongsu's mother. Around 1983, Yongsu's mother um, acquired gods and paintings from her sister, who was also a shaman, uh, who in my writing I call Chatterbox. Chatterbox was retiring from the shaman profession. Chatterbox was going to live with her son. He didn't like her being a shaman. Chatterbox sort of asked the gods, and she thought that she had gotten some agreement that she could give this up happily. She had dreams where her grandfathers and grandmothers said they wanted to go to Yongsu's mother's shrine. Yongsu's mother had a dream and she saw all of her sister's grandmothers and grandfathers going into her shrine. They thought it would work. So they brought the paintings over. They had a ceremony where Chatterbox said goodbye to her grandmothers and grandfathers, and they danced, and they were celebrated, and they seemed to agree to go into Yongsu's mother's shrine and live there happily. Well, it didn't work. Yongsu's mother, and hmm, it's going to be a little difficult to read this. Um, okay, but in her words, and I really want to give you her words, at least through the tissue of translation. She said, um, there was no bright energy, no yungi coming from them to me. When the gods are there, you feel it. Without it, you, you can't put them on your wall. You approach them with an empty mind, and they command you. But when I put up the new paintings, things were all kilter, strange. My luck was off. And then, whenever I tried to work with them, the words just didn't come out. It was as if they were mumbling and grumbling. It was all wrong. And then she began to have 
strange dreams. In one dream, three women came to her house for divination. And she brought out her divination tray, like the tray you see in that painting. And she was going to cast rice and coins and begin to see visions that would enable her to develop a diagnosis, aided by the great spirit grandmother, her personal guardian, God. But now it was three women. One woman sat down to get her divination. The other two women said, no, no, they would stay standing, which was a little weird. And they were hovering in the corner, and she felt very uncomfortable. This is still in the dream. And she begins to shake the rice and cast it on the tray. And suddenly, one of the standing women comes forward, grabs the tray, spills the rice on the floor, and she wakes up. And she wakes up feeling really bad because it's the rice of her great spirit grandmother, her guardian, that's been cast on the floor. It's been treated so disrespectfully. So she goes into the shrine, and lo and behold, the paintings have fallen on the floor. And her great spirit grandmother and the jade immortal that was Chatterbox's primary deity are stuck together on the floor. She says, they've been fighting. They've been fighting and they put each other down to the floor. So she says, the new gods have got to go. They're just not going to work. They're not going to cohabit with their own grandmothers and grandfathers. So she asks them to leave with proper ceremony. She rolls up the paintings, puts them under the altar. They're just paintings, and they don't get any offerings. They're not seeds of gods anymore. Now, when I heard this story, it, it really fascinated me, but I didn't quite know what to do with it, what to make of it. And it just stayed with me for a while. I, try, I talked about it in some context, but I, I didn't know where to go. Meanwhile, early in the new millennium, I had an opportunity to work in Vietnam. And I worked with a team of scholars from the Vietnam Museum of Ethnology, and we looked at the statues that Vietnamese spirit mediums use. And I learned a lot about statues. I learned in particular, and I was kind of surprised, that throughout the map of Asia, Buddhas, temple statues, Hindu deities, um, have a special ritual activity where the essence of the deity is actually put inside the statue. And then in the case of Buddhas, in the case of Hindu deities, the eye, the statue's eye is open. It's ritually made, essentially present. And I thought, I felt really stupid. I'd been bowing to Buddhas most of my adult life, and I never quite realized, hey, the Buddha's there. Um, so I thought, and then I began to hear stories about inappropriate statues. The statue that ought not to have been in a particular temple and caused bad things to happen. The statue that got knocked off kilter when the spirit medium was cleaning her shrine and bad things happened. And I thought about Gnosis Mother's paintings. And I thought, maybe I should go back to Korea with some of the questions that we had generated in Vietnam and see if I can learn more about shaman paintings. What could they tell me? Um, now, at first I thought, well, all right, Buddhists get their eyes painted, and uh, medium, spirit medium statues get their eyes painted. They're sensually made aware. They have animation stuff put in them. There's a specific ritual. And I, that was what I was looking for. And in fact, when shamans put Buddhists in their shrines, they do a Buddhist, a proper Buddhist eye opening. They either call in a monk, or they do the ritual themselves, and they mimic the monk. They take, they buy a crib sheet from one of those shops around Shogesan, and they do the ritual themselves. But when I started to ask about the paintings, it was completely different. Um, Yosef's mother said to me, um, no, there's no ritual. There's nothing. There's no hangings on. It's when the shaman has her initiation ritual, she sees the gods 
in front of her face. And she knows that they're there, they're going to sit in the shrine. And I thought, that's strange, did I hear right? And a few months later, I was back in Korea, I asked again, no, there's no ritual, it just happens when the shaman invites them in, in the initiation, and they go into a shrine. And then I remembered, some of you may have seen the film that Diana Lee and I made about the young initiate who's trying so hard to be a shaman, and there's one point toward the end of the film where finally she goes up on the knife blades and she says, oh, Tawa Su, Tawa, Tawa. And they're all here. All of the gods are here. Meaning, you know, she had seen them in front of her face and they had gone into the shrine. And I thought, that's it. That's, that's what they're talking about, that kind of experience. However, in this case, they were there, but they weren't there strongly enough, and that poor shaman failed. That was a failed ritual. There's a certain ambiguity about it. Um, another shaman I talked to, Matt Munchin saw, she said to me, um, you know, a lot of shamans have empty shrines. The gods aren't there. We know. We can tell these things, but you can't. And, um, that, that sort of made sense for me. Um, okay, so I wish I had a little bit of light here. Okay, so, um, so sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not there, and sometimes they're there, but their presence is very weak. And sometimes they're there, but they don't get along well with the other deities who are there. And, and what the shaman experiences is the kind of mumbling and grumbling, like static in a radio transmission that Yosu's mother experienced. Uh, so it's, it's the presence of the deity that enables the shaman Oh, thank you. <laughs> that enables the shaman to um, to give the divinations he's supposed to give, to incarnate the deities and speak in their voice and give the messages that they transmit. But in the shaman's world, if you don't, even if you don't get a clear transmission. Even if the words don't come through clearly, the pressure is on you, you the shaman, to get it right. And if you don't get it right, you'll be punished, and maybe your clients will be punished. Um, the gods expect proper treatment. Every morning, the manshin pours clear water, and the deities that like liquor get their liquor, and candles are lit, and incense is burned. And this is an obligation to maintain the shrine well, to keep it clean, um, to do things properly. When Yosu's mother broke her leg and was flat on her back, she was having horrible dreams again. And she had to tell her son, her son is a guy who really feels uncomfortable with the shrine and the gods, she ordered him, you have to go down there and pour the water, pour the liquor, and light the candles, or else. And he did, and she stopped having these troublesome dreams. So, shamans describe a cycle, one of the, there's the maintenance of the shrine, and then there's an intense cycle of going to pray on sacred mountains. And one old shaman who I talked to said, you know, we go and recharge our batteries. And I began to see how there's a kind of triangulation between the shrine, the mobile body of the shaman, and the mountain. The mobile body of the shaman that can move back and forth between the shrine, where her deities are, and the mountains, where God power is. And when she goes to the shrine, she, um, can't give a greeting when she leaves the house. She can't say, I'm going to the mountain, bye. She has to just go out without words. And when she comes back, she can't say, I've returned. 
uh, she just goes straight into the shrine and bows. It's like an electrical connection, that charge of power from the mountain, carried in the shaman's body back to the shrine, and then the recharged shrine, the happy deities, are going to work well with her helper in the practice. And so going to the mountain, one has to be pure, one has to be carefully washed, one can't complain that one's feet hurt on the journey. Um, oops. And I've probably been talking a little bit too long, but what, what I was left with was a sense of ambiguity, the ambiguity of how empowered is the shaman right now? How good is her relationship with the deities? How strong are the deities in the shrine? Is it a full shrine? Is it an empty shrine? Are these deities powerful enough to have those words come through? And by looking at paintings, I was able to see this all in a new way and appreciate how the paintings are charged and powerful, agentive, um, working with agent of shamans. She's animated in that she literally moves when she manifests them. They are animated in the sense that they are seen as seats of power. Okay, so that's it for anthropology. Now, in writing the book, the, uh, uh, to appreciate that these paintings are also works of art, some more than others, some people hate them, many people are growing to love them. And the person who has, I think, done the most to help us understand and appreciate these paintings as art, as a genre of Korean folk art, is um, Professor Yoon Yeol Soo, who will be speaking next. He has a wonderful collection, which some of you know the Dali Museum. He is the director. And he has made a very serious study of the paintings as art. He will share some very wonderful images of some very wonderful paintings with you next. Please welcome you, Yosu. And um, Dr. Young and I will do some translating. Okay. Uh, from the beginning, he thought of the painting, the paintings as paintings, as a genre of art. When we began to work together, he, he began to think of them more in psychological terms, in, in, so, in social terms. Uh, so, I like the paintings of the paintings. So he's going to show you several examples of paintings. Uh, yeah, isn't this like a folk painting? But this is the shaman god Sonang, who is um, venerated as a pine tree. Uh, 
Okay, so we see this in Korean folk painting a lot, the tiger under the tree, and it's kind of humorous, but this is also a shaman painting. Okay. In, in Korea, the mountain god is usually male, but in the shaman tradition, sometimes a female mountain god will appear. 여기서 가장 중요한 것은 호랑이가 어, 무슨 그 고양이처럼 아니면 전혀 호랑이라고 느끼지 못할 만큼 어, 아주 특별한 특히 꼬리를 그 산보다 더 크게 그린 어, 아주 독특한 그 그림이 무신도에 나타나고 있습니다. So um, it's uh, the tiger. Almost like a like a domestic cat, but even more than that, it's just you know it's it's taking a lovely leisurely stroll. 아, 네 이게 그 산신령인데 아마 호랑이가 무거워서 힘들어서. <웃음> okay, for those of you who didn't get that, it looks like or right, here's the mountain god, and he's kind of heavy. The tiger seems burdened by the weight of the god on his back. 실제로 이 그림을 그린 사람이 어, 스케치 대상 실력이 어, 좋지 못하기 때문에 이렇게밖에 못 그렸습니다. 어, 그림을 그린 사람이 스케치 대상 실력이 좋지 못해서 그렇게 그렸습니다. 아, 오케이, 오케이. So the painter didn't like. He started to sketch it in the next image. He didn't like it, so he gave it probably gave it up. 다음. 네, 역시 그 호랑이가 얼굴이 좀 크게 하고 어, 그 일반적인 호랑이와는 전혀 다른 무신보입니다. Yeah. yeah, this is okay again, a really different sort of tiger. 아, 마찬가지입니다. 특수한 호랑입니다. Yeah, yeah, so it, yeah, just the same here. A really different kind of tiger. 아. 어, 지금 어, 보시고 계시는 이런 호랑이는 무신도 중에서 황해도 영향을 받은 무신도에서만 나타납니다. 한국의 호랑이 그림이 많지만 이런 그림은 황해도 무신도에 나타나는 특징입니다. Okay, so this kind of painting is a specialty of the 황해도 tradition of shaman painting. 아, 네, 호랑이가 뒤에 숨어 있습니다. 부끄러워서. <웃음> He's a shy. The tiger is a very shy. The 일본의 순경 순사 모자입니다. 아, uh, okay. So the the hat, if you look closely, it's it's like the the red dot on the Japanese flag. So it helps to date the painting. 아, 그 무시 무속 신앙에서 산신령이 위대하다는 것을 아, 일 그, 시대적인 배경을 이룰 수 있는 아주 중요한 것입니다. 
This one was probably painted by a painter who paints Buddhist paintings, as, as many of them were. Ah, ah, 일월 일월 성신 보인데 자세히 보시면 그 사람이 구름 위에 떠 있기 때문에 표정이 구름 위에 떠 있는 표정을 잘잘 나타내고 있습니다. Okay, so it's the sun and the moon and the um, is the velocity the of uh, the spirit comes out comes across very clearly. Ah. 이렇게 대체적으로 무신 무속 신앙 중에서 어, 위대한 인물이라고 생각하면 항상 구름 위에 떠 있다고 생각했기 때문에 구름을 저렇게 일곱 개를 그려서 구름 위에 떠 있는 어, 신 신경을 그렸습니다. 네. What is uh, the bottom of the painting here? That is, uh, I understand, my understanding is the term spiritual power. It's a symbol of the spiritual power described like this in Asia. Yeah, um, because they're floating along on clouds and normal people don't do that. Um, yeah, 이것은 주로 계룡산 쪽에서만 나타나는 그러니까 원래는 어, 무신도의 그 얼굴이 나타나지 않고 어, 위에 보시는 그 신들의 이름을 적어서 어, 구설했지만 시대가 내려오면서 이렇게 무속 에, 장군들이 얼굴이 나타나기 시작합니다. So this is from Gerio Mountain, a very powerful place. And in the beginning, they, there would be strips with just the name of the deity on it. But over time, uh, people began to produce them with the faces of generals coming out like this. And it, you know, very, looks like some action cartoon. <laughs> okay, so this is, this is the Chinese hero, Zhang Bei. And this is on the cover of the book. Zhang Bei and the yeah. Okay, so a special feature of his face is it's it's kind of a reddish face and then the eyes are done in such a way that it's like you see light coming out of those eyes. It's a very special, uncanny power of the eye that's captured in the painting. Okay, so Mr. Yoon believes from the quality of this painting that this would have been painted by someone who was trained in the court academy to paint paintings for, for official shrines. Okay, so Guang uh, the Chinese warrior of the Three Kingdoms period who you see in the Chinese restaurants with the red face and the long beard. Yeah, so a special feature of this one, the way his beard is divided into the three sections. Okay, so among all the sunshine, this is the one with the white tiger. Uh -huh. Okay, so this was like the Olympic mascot, the white tiger. Uh -huh. Okay, so this was the mascot. Come from the Winter Olympics, and this was to let me see if I get correct me if I get this wrong to let the world know about the specialness <coughs> of the Korean tiger. 그러나 한국에는 백호는 살지 않습니다. 없습니다. 다만 무신도에만 등장합니다. Yeah. Okay, but they don't really live in Korea white tigers, but they do live on uh, shaman paintings. 다음 <laughs> 중국 사신. 
So this is. Ah, uh, so this is a a Chinese official, and who is venerated as a shaman deity. Ah. Ah. Oh, okay, okay. Um, remembering what Mr. Yun has told me about this. Okay, it's um, Confucius, Buddha, and Christ. And now naive eyes look at this and say, oh, Christ is a little higher up and so on. But Mr. Yun says, no, Christ is kind of on the outside here. But the pose is probably taken off a Christian tract, a very common Christ pose that the painter copied from a Christian source. 어 이런 분은 어 천구백 한 삼십 년 서오십 년 이런 시기에 나타난 분입니다. Yeah, yeah. So um, sometime between the 1930s and the 1950s, this this painting would have been produced. 아, 아, 예. 제가 좋아하는 책이 있는 그림을 보여드리겠습니다. 고맙습니다. And now, Dr. Young, who is a folklorist, and I can help And I really envy his his deep breadth and depth of knowledge of, of the Korean shaman. I should say traditions in plural. And uh, he he began. Um, is collecting paintings when he was very young. He'll tell you a little bit about that. And when he finally retired from his whole career at the Folk Museum, he was able to realize the dream of establishing a private museum where um, the, the paraphernalia and the paintings of Korean shamans, most of whom he had known personally, um, are, are exhibited, and one of the primary groups of visitors to his museum are shamans themselves, who come to the shamanism museum to see aspects, artifacts of their tradition that they themselves had never seen in their own experience. And, uh, we'll wait a minute for... Are we ready? Not that one. To stay there. Um, for the during the years, I have spent as collector and researcher and the creator of the National Folk Museum of Korea. In many fact, what was discussed in the book, the uh, our pictures here. So I do. We, we, I thought it was the prepares the copies here, but they don't. But I brought this one up here. And the shamanic art to English-speaking leaders and international audience. Well, uh, today, uh, Dr. Kendall and Dr. Yun you know, already told you a lot about this in Korean shaman paintings, but uh, I would like to introduce you my own museum. We established in a three years ago in the Jeonnyeong area, but I moved to the Inpyeong area. So I brought these photos here and I explained to you about these paintings, the collections, and how I built these museums, and how I wrote all these German uh, 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 activities in Korea. So let me see. Uh, what can I see again? For, for Ah, too many. Yeah. Okay, we just open this one. But too many photos here. So I'll, I'll explain this very briefly. Oh, okay, stop. This is the one part of the uh, shaman, uh, shaman Museum. You can see the penis, the, the symbol of the map. So you can produce the, uh, uh, the child. So one uh, example of the uh, shaman paintings in uh, Seoul and Gyeonggi area. 
uh, this uh, Brian Street, Brian Street, the so traditional society, the Brian Shamans, the bond, the bond, the very spiritual. So uh, nowadays you can find the Brian uh, uh, Street in the shrine. Yes. yes. Okay, so another example of the uh, painting is uh, a port, port uh, a lady. Yes, one. Yeah, that is a uh, TT for seven stars. It's a very popular, very popular you can find that uh, spirit. But this creature is a thousand, but uh, we have our indigenous, our indigenous TT for spirit. So that gives you and also longevity. So it's a certain, you can pay for your longevity. So this will help you. Okay, this is another uh, example of the uh, hawk lady. And she attracts digits. Okay, so nowadays a very uh, modern digits, but this is the traditional society. The digits is most uh, worry. This is, you know, you got some disease and you uh, uh, die. So the always the people pay to the spirit for uh, uh, death. Yeah, then another example of the uh, Sambur Jesa, you saw uh, from the candles photo, Sambur is a sleep uh, spirit. So number three is very <coughs> important to understand Korean shamanism. So you connect with the uh, Dangun uh, uh, methodology. So Hanun, Hanun, Dangun, Wangun. So one to three is also connected to one to three, is seven. This is five, six, seven. It is also connected to 12, 99, uh, 100 numbers. So it's a very uh, uh, a basic number of the Korean uh, shamanic uh, 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 tradition. Okay, that is Bali Gong Yun. Could you like explain to us? Okay, quick note on Bali Gong Yun. Bali Gong Yun was the seventh daughter of a king and queen who really wanted a son, tried really hard to have a son. And by the time number seven daughter comes along, the king is just disgusted and says, we're going to cast the baby out. So she's Bala Korida. And she is taken up and raised by a couple of mystics in the mountains. But Buddha is really angry with her parents that they cast this baby out and uh, makes the king and queen ill. And the only way they can be saved is uh, a magic herb that grows in the land of the dead. And they ask their daughters to go get it, the six daughters who remain. And the six daughters have all these conventional Korean women reasons why they can't go. Uh, it's my mother-in-law's Fanga. It's my uh, father-in-law's Jessa. I'm pregnant. Yeah, so, but, so they say, well, let's at least find the one we cast out and apologize to her. And they find by the the messenger comes from the court. She says, I was, uh, I produced by my father's seed in 10 months in my mother's womb, so I will go to the underworld. And she goes off, and she's this female heroine who has all sorts of incredible adventures. And she gets the magic herb. She also acquires a husband and seven sons in the process, brings it back. <laughs> In time to bring her parents back to life, her father offers her the kingdom, but like a bodhisattva, she says, no, I've seen the sorrow and panic of the people passing to the other world. I will stay there and help them. And that's by the Gongju. And in the Put for the Dead, the shamans sing a very long ballad describing her adventures. And it's sort of... Um, to my mind, it's parallel of what women do in shamanic practice for the dead, which is very different from what sons do in the Confucian tradition. In shamanic ritual, it's the women's ritual that really helps get the dead through the underworld.
Wow. <clears throat> that is the uh, Dango, the founder of the nation. Oh. It's very difficult to find this kind of painting in shaman painting. It's about 200 years. Next. 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 OK, that is another types of the uh, seven stars, the deeper the spirit. It's a much older painting style. Yeah. Well, this is a uh, mountain spirit, Sanji. So, uh, this guy brought a lot of examples of the mountain spirit. But this uh, our region's uh, our painting. Um, you can see uh, the young boy and young lady, uh, left and right. So, supporting the girl spirit. Next one. Yes, okay. That's another part. It's very the other one is in the Oban Xinjiang, uh, five direction uh, spirit. Uh, we said, but very unusual. That time is like in Dr. Kendall, this uh, afternoon came to the museum and they discussed about this painting. It's very uh, different from other Oban Xinjiang because that has, like, you can see the uh, right, right. Uh, uh, depth in the right, the stepney, one, one person uh, fall, the wrong right. And also, you can see the uh, central person, the, uh, the central spirit that has the three very big eyes, very big eyes. All the five, five people, they have different eyes. Okay? So, so, so it's very interesting, very interesting. But we still believe this is Oban Xinjiang. The center painting is another uh, type of the Kungwin, uh, uh, the lady from the court. So she has power and protect the people, and also protect the digits. Uh, OK, this is an inner solution. Sun and Moon. The inner summation uh, is directly connected with the Taoists. So during the uh, Korean dynasty in Korea, the uh, government believed the inner summation for a uh, nation of uh, protected. So uh, it's very important. Even now. So you can see start two studies in the bottom. The right one is also a symbol of the Taoism. We call it Namguk Noen, old man from uh, 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 the, the, the Taoism. And the left one is Noza. You know, Noza is a, 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 also the founder of the Taoism. It's called in the Tezang Noen. Name is the So those targets you can find in very old shamanic shrine in Korea, made by wood. Next one. Next. Okay, this is another type of the people. Yes. Okay, it's all different collections. Okay, stop this. Okay, this is the main uh, spirit in Kumizong uh, Shrine. So the, sh the museum of the shamanism is now in the Kumizong Shrine, which is designated as a national treasure by Korean government. So that uh, painting is the Kumizong Devon. Kumizong Devon is the son of the Sejong, and uh, he was trying to help the Danjong, and then uh, you know, the Danjong and Sejong uh, they have this power, so that is, you know, they have some great uh, uh, fighting during that time. So he was killed by the Sento and then uh, carrying the spiritual uh, 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 God in, uh, among the alternate people in his own area, in the province. 
So this shrine is this is this spirit is main spirit of the Tunzong shrine, and then uh, so there's a uh, center of the shrine with the space. Uh, you can see the belt, the Sang Wang Nation is a, a kind of the uh, mountain spirit. You can see many examples of the painting, but also you can find it was just a name on there. No painting. But you can see uh, the spirit, uh, mountain spirit with this name, Sangwang Nation, this great spirit of the uh, mountain king. And then also you see the uh, right one is the Sun Brigade, it's an anthologist in the city of uh, Sweden. Next one. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Back, please. Okay, this uh, uh, in traditional society, some children didn't have money to you know, or got this in the paintings. If you, if you only have painting, which is called Shamanic painting, you are trying to have to pay money. So they, they use that uh, rice paper for making the spirit. So they put it on the shrine. Instead, they put it in the painting. So this tradition is still you can find, but it's not uh, unusual. Uh, so it's on types of the, uh, uh, in its own area, the shaman uh, uh, spirit. Next one. That, yeah, that's all. Uh, this is. Yes, yes. Come on, that. Okay. Uh, it's a chop canvas. You can make it five. Okay. So you go to the shaman shrine and you find these candles. And there are some matches. Matches, candles, you can make it in the fire. So fire, water is very important. The symbol of the ritual in shaman tradition in India. That is a uh, Tangun, Tangun painting, uh, the shamanic way. You can find the Tangun painting in Daejeongyo, but uh, it's very similar, but this is uh, one type of the shamanic uh, painting. And so uh, made in uh, probably uh, during the uh, Japanese colonization in 1910 to 1945. In the time, uh, they created a lot of the Tangun paintings. That means like national names. So how we have our own culture, we have our own history. So at that time, a lot of the uh, shamans, they produce their paintings and uh, put in their shrine. So our tradition is different to Japanese one. Okay. Yeah, another type of the, uh, the people. Next one. Okay, that is the old man and the young man. Okay? So man has power, like in Sun Sun Wan, the young lady helping the old man, but she could do it. Okay? Yeah. So another type of the mountain street is a pet pole. This I you explain to you the bed boy is uh, uh, it's not easy to find the bed boy the uh, white color the white color white is important the white is power you see the king wears king horse is white horse okay so white symbolizes the power so there's a white uh, tiger shows us that the dead mountain has a very big power. Next one. Maybe uh, the David, Professor David Mason, you please explain about the mountain spirit a little bit here. Yeah. Could you like to explain this mountain spirit, please? Thank you. Uh, the, the, the landlord, the 
the Lord of the mountain, the king of the mountain, uh, and the, kind of the, the energy, the particular characteristics of a particular mountain personified into a human-like spirit, uh, which it becomes a kind of primary spirit in Korean culture. Most Buddhist temples have a mountain spirit shrine, which they regard as kind of their landlord spirit, you know, they're on his mountain. <laughs> and they ask for permission to stay there. Shamans use the mountain spirit very much for their energy and their insight. Uh, often their kind of, their spirituality is kind of based in the mountain spirit and then they go from there to utilize uh, various other spirits. And uh, they, uh, it's also recognized in Confucianism, the Confucian style rituals done for the mountain spirit is kind of a collective village ancestor a figure that sort of draws the whole village together, like this is the origin of us all. And it has kind of an ecological meaning, these kind of paintings of human beings living in harmony with nature. There's always the red pine tree in the painting, which is the king of all plants, always a tiger, which is king of all animals, and surrounded by beautiful, the mountains surrounded by beautiful nature, and a human figure in the middle of that in harmony. Mountain spirit never carries a weapon, always is benevolent, has uh, herbal offerings for good health, generally, uh, tea and um, mushrooms, uh, yongji bosom and ginseng, things like that offering that make for good health, that we get that good health by living in harmony with nature. There's meaning for that. Thank you. There's another Christian and uh, yeah, there's another types of the panel. Panel. This Igor Songshin, as I explained, he is Igor Sun and Moon, and what is the spirit, uh, what is the uh, spiritual power, in part you can see that. Much like the Kulum, but this is what we call the Yongi. Yongi is the uh, spiritual power. Yeah, that is Chaktu Jangun, the uh, general spirit, uh, sending on the uh, two knives, what is uh, without any socks and shoes. So it has the uh, weapons, it's right in their hands, as a two or knives, and their spirit stands on the uh, knife. Especially, you can find this painting uh, in the Pamela province, in the Kema province, in North Korea. It's more, uh, they have more, I think, uh, to death, the shamans, the heritage shamans themselves. It's more uh, spiritual, uh, 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 spirit. And then another, a uh, nice stone, a uh, stone. Uh, stone sculptures, the, uh, the, uh, we call it Eki Jango, there's a baby, baby uh, gender. So the past is, yeah, so all of it. Yeah, there's, oh, okay. okay that is, yeah, there's, uh, if you want to have them, the boy, and we just play there, and then we have you, we have baby. Yes. Past is. I, uh, this is uh, one type of the uh, Hinalayan shamans. I collected from the Nepal. I went to Nepal three, uh, three times. So uh, I researched there and then uh, I, I brought from the Nepal. But I think most of the shamans in Nepal are uh, male. In Korea, uh, maybe 75% uh, of the shamans are female. But, uh, Upstate in uh, the province, more uh, male shamans you can find. Of course, they have the female shamans, but most of the dominant of the shamans are male. So this is one type. But he's not Nepali, <laughs> but he's like Western, like in uh, Monarchy. So, <laughs> <Marcus. laughs> yes, uh, yeah. So, right one, yeah, this one is from Korea. 
1991, I went to Mongolia to the certain shamanic things I collect on. So this uh, abrupt Korea. Uh, uh, so it's very similar to the uh, Malian shamans and Mongolian shamans, like the Siberian, Mongolian, and Galian. These are connected. You can find the bears can affect the things. You can see a uh, uh, that that bears that that the shaman on on you know body. That's very popular. You can find you can find all shaman there in Korea. I can tell you either. I can tell you Ireland, the Jinzong who is the, the expert of the Jesu shamanism. It, uh, he collected Bacon bears in Jeju Island during the 1960s. It's very somehow correct with each other. Yes. Next one. Next. Yeah, all the uh yeah, please. Like in uh pepper flowers. In the past, they used a lot of pepper flowers. Nowadays, like the real flower they use. But pepper flowers are important. They are definitely trying to bond. That means the spirit will help. Okay, there's a kind of a gap and peace. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. No, I'm sorry, yes, please. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, all different kinds of pepper flowers. Yeah. Next one. <coughs> Next one. Yes. Next. All the items in our museum, so when you come to our museum, you can see all of those items. Yeah. Next one. That shrine is one uh, uh, of course of the museum is the style of art in Hange shamanism. So they put the old paintings uh, from where and left and right, everywhere. And the bottom you can find the pants. And there's bears and there's equipment over there and there's a cross and the cross over there and for the ancestors. Those paintings brought from North Korea during the Korean War. Uh, I got these materials from my uh, teacher. I, I'm not a shaman, but one, one of my teachers was trying to make me the shaman. She's not the Irish initiative, no. But he, she gave me, she gave me, before I got to the United States for studies, uh, she gave me and then uh, after I finished my studies, I come back to Korea and then I told her, well, I still have the paintings, you only have steel. You cannot, if you only have that, can I give you? She, she said, no, already this uh, uh, paintings are yours. Then she got the paintings from her spiritual father, the many shaman had. So she cannot use that painting for her uh, uh, shaman practice because that spirit from the male shaman. So she thought this I can have, I can use someday. And she thought I can I have now. So I <laughs> opened this museum with this painting. Okay, all right, okay. So I, I think I stopped you. Just show this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, American ties of the Japanese. Oh, this is a military man, military man in Korea. So he just uh, bring this in information. Okay? Yeah, so oh, that is enemy over there. So can you know, uh, away from him. Yeah. So this is important to know the journey. Uh, so the uh, shamanism, shamanism is also is connected with like, this kind of activities. 
I think is I stop here. Yeah. So maybe we can. Thank you very much. So we have some time for questions. Oh, okay. And are questions for any of us. Or comments. Sean Mastrain is a set of pop from a. What they hear is unclear or vague. They still have to do the best they can, but they don't. You know, the gods are not helping them as much as they, the shamans would like. So you, I mean, you sort of, sort of think of it as like elect, an electric current or a television or radio transmission. And there are strong transmissions and there are weaker transmissions. I think most shamans would understand that analogy. But uh, Dr. Young, I think, has a deeper understanding of these matters. Well, yeah, thank you. But can I explain to us a little about this, you know, question that you have experienced? Yeah, there's some hard questions about the context of this question. Okay, do you mean, uh, with your question, you're referring to the relationship between the paintings and the power? This very intangible one and the very religious one. So the shaman has their spiritual power, which as they use every day for their you know, uh, rituals and practice to the clients. Uh, so yeah, that is power. Yeah, so, so you cannot touch. But there's your, you know, uh, the shaman said, "Oh, I have power," and they you know they dance on the uh, knife and they give the uh, message, the spirit, the, the spirit message, and they they can give you, they can give you the energy, the power to hold your, you know, long life and your business and your promotion and your what for your everyday life. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a guess. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I'm Yunhikia, and I'm studying Korean traditional music. Um, I, what I have learned from uh, the, for example, when it comes to the Longak, the farmer's music and dance, also they do those rituals, and then sometimes they have those trees, they, they are carrying the bamboo tree, right? Or they carry the flags. So also they say the spirits will descend and sit on the tree or the flags. So my guess is, or my thought to this is, uh, for to, to the shaman paintings, it might be quite similar. Actually, the spirits need a place where they are, right? They need a, a place where they are invited to. So the fans, which are carried by the shamans, or the shaman paintings, are providing that place where the spirits can descend and then give uh, their power. Uh -huh. So we stop there because time is passing. Um, afterwards, you can ask other questions as well. Thank you very much. There are now one of the RAS upcoming lectures, excursions, events. Um, what's that? Uh, next week we have an extra lecture, and I still haven't really quite understood that it's a very senior uh, Korean journalist uh, who has a lot of tales to tell. The personal journey of a Korean journalist, A.W. Lee, who's a very, very well-known person. And uh, so this will be next Tuesday, uh, June the 28th, uh, an extra lecture. And then the first lecture in July, July 12, uh, Dr. Judith Cherry, like me, an MBE. Um, she is uh, in England, she is from England, she teaches in England, and her lecture is about doing business in South Korea. Her studies are in business studies, 
So sociocultural barriers to doing business in South Korea. Uh, this should be a very interesting, completely different kind of topic from tonight. Uh, pictures from the past. Norman Thorpe has collected a large number of old postcards, historic Korean postcards, and he will show us the postcards and uh, give you his commentary on uh, the way they depict Korea uh, from the time when they were made. Then our excursions, the upcoming excursion this Sunday, June 26, Jennifer. This Sunday, if you have nothing else to occupy you, I hope you will join us when we're heading down to Jeonju, where we will see a number of fairly important uh, Joseon and more contemporary historical and cultural sites, and more importantly, we will eat a lot. Jeonju's <laughs> 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 particularly, <laughs> lots of food. Jeonju's particularly well known for its food culture, so we're going to be going down exploring, eating, exploring, eating, and exploring around. Uh, it's a very, very beautiful place, and so I hope that if you have free time that day, we'll come and go. And then Jeremy, who is there at the back, um, is going to take us precisely to uh, the Museum of Shamanism. And after viewing that, up there, um, we will go on to a small temple, which is not so far away, um, a delightful walk up and back. Um, and Jeremy has promised that this will be a very beautiful tour and it will not rain. <laughs> July the 9th. And then, well, I'm offering this tour. I don't know if anyone wants to go. If you go all the way down south, in the southwest corner, you have Penam and um, Kanjin. And in Kanjin, the great scholar Tasan was exiled for 18 years, and he met two of the monks from Tehomsa, which is in Penam. So we will visit both the Tehomsa and the, the sites in Kangjin associated with Tasan, Cho Ui, and the, um, the history of tea, also the museum associated with Yun Zan Do and his family. And if we have time, we'll also go to the place where the Dutchman, Hendrik Hamel, uh, was imprisoned with his colleagues for several years, quite a number of years, in the 17th century. That's all down in Kangji and in Henan. That's uh, an overnight tour, July 2 3. Our reading club will meet on July the 4th, and we will discuss this challenging story by Isan of the 1930s. Uh, Korea's great surrealist writer, The Dark Room of the Map. We did that. Oh, well, that's a long time ago. That's still in September. We will go back. We were there last week, National Museum of Korean Contemporary History. But this is important because I, just now we're talking about the Peace Corps. This is the Peace Corps. Right, right. This is a special exhibition which they are organizing, this is our Vice President, um, about the history of the Peace Corps in Korea, Friends of Korea. And so we will have this guided tour um, in September, on September 21st. And we have books. I'm sorry that we don't have your book. We will get it as soon as we can, and we will send it to everybody at a discount if you remember. Yes, great discount. But also then we are still having a book sale. We are having a book sale on the most of our stock, some with radically slashed prices. So take a look at the homepage and buy some books. And after this then we will go to Jacobs, we will have beer or whatever, and uh, we can talk a bit more if you are not too tired. A little while. Um, actually, you prefers to have macaroni, so we have to move to an e chat for macaroni. <laughs> and then become a member of the artist if you're not, and please, as you stand up, put the chair straight under the table. Thank you very much. See you next week.